notes to page 646. We'll pray for um, two things. We'll pray for the unity of the church on prayer number three, and then for uh, prayer number five, the spirit of prayer. We'll pray these in unison this morning. Page 646. <coughs> pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. Pray together, prayer five together. Almighty God, you pour out on us all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us when we draw near to you from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may worship you in spirit and truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to be looking at Psalm 90. It's uh, the psalm for today and our worship today. It's good to have Dana Clay back from the UK. <laughs> Thank Thanks you for letting us know how you were doing. And Thank you for praying me back. <laughs> the C.S. Lewis stuff was a real treat uh, in the British Museum. So thank you for those oh. little treats from C.S. Lewis. And General John, great to have you back, and uh, such a pleasure pleasure to have you, um, and all of you this morning. So this is the joy of pastoring this type of congregation. There's so much in and out of this congregation. We're a traveling church. So anyway, it's beautiful. Uh, so with that, let's look at Psalm, Psalm 90. Psalm 90. So we'll, we'll read it from the prayer book first, but if you have your translations, you, your Bible translations, you'll also want to look there too. So. so this is a prayer, a psalm of Moses. It's the only one attributed to Moses, uh, interestingly enough. Let's, pr let's uh, say and pray this by whole verse together. Deacon Christine, will you lead us in, in this reading and prayer? Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before, Before the foundations were brought forth, or the earth and the world were made, you are God from everlasting and the world without end. You turn men back to the dust. You say, return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday, even as a day that is past. You scatter them as a night watch that comes quickly to an end. They are even as a dream and fade away. They are like the grass, which in the morning is green, but in the evening is dried up and withered. For we consume away in your displeasure and are afraid at your wrathful indignation. You have set our misdeeds before you, and our <coughs> secret sins in the light of your countenance. For when you are angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end as a tale that is told. The days of our life are seventy years, and though some be so strong that they come to eighty years, yet is their span but labor and sorrow. So soon it passes away, and we are gone. But who regards the power of your wrath, and who considers the fierceness of your anger? So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Turn again, O Lord, and tarry not. Be gracious unto your servants. O satisfy us with your mercy in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be glad of all the days of our life. Comfort us again, according to the measure of the days that you have afflicted us, and for the years in which we have suffered adversity. Show your servants your work, and their children your glory, 
and may the grace of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper the work of our hands. Oh, prosper our handiwork. Amen. Amen. How many of you liked Psalm 90? How many of you come back to the psalm every now and then? It's a really, a really uh, good psalm. In, this, in the message today, we'll be looking at uh, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. This is from the ESV here. And it'll go along with uh, the parable that Jesus tells about the talents. And so I won't give any more spoiler alerts for the sermon. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of where we're headed with the sermon today. Um, Psalm 90 is significant for quite a few reasons. Uh, as we said, it's the only one associated with Moses. And Moses was a towering figure in the Old Testament. Um, he and David, perhaps, are the two most towering figures in the Old Testament. And so um, it's interesting that this is the only one attributed to him. It's, he's considered a man of prayer. He's called a man of prayer in, in a couple of places in the Old Testament. Um, one, one of the most famous incidents in the Old Testament is in Exodus 32, 33, and 34. And that's the account when God gave the children of Israel the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. You remember the first thing that Moses encountered when he came off the mountain was them worshiping the golden calf. And that put Moses in a very awkward position as the mediator of the people. Uh, now, God had set up his brother as the priestly group. Uh, Aaron and his brothers were the priestly tribe. And you think of a priest as being a mediator, right? That's the job of a priest is to mediate between, uh, you know, God and people. That's what a priest does. But Moses, and, and like all of us in this room, are priests. We are the priesthood of all believers. And one of the main ways that we function as priests is prayer. Think about it. That is one way that we offer mediation for ourselves and for other people. And so Moses, even though he wasn't a priest, found himself in a mediating position there when the children of Israel were worshiping the golden calf. So what does he do? And we're not going to read. What, what does he do? He throws the tablets down. First of all, he gets very upset. Yes. Which is, he thought it was sound of rejoicing, though, I think. He th to yeah. begin with. Yeah. <laughs> He thought these good old Israelites were rejoicing that he was coming down from the mountain, and yet they were not. They were rejoicing, or they were clamoring because they were worshiping a golden calf, falling right back to their old ways of slavery uh, that the Egyptians would have worshipped. But anyway, we're not going to read 32, 33, and 34, but there's a, there's a famous passage, and I'll just read, read that passage out of those three chapters. It's 34, verses 6 and 7. And Moses gets into a long dialogue with God, a prayer. Those three chapters. He's talking back and forth with God. And at the end of that, at the end of that dialogue, it says, And God passed in front of Moses, or excuse me, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. But that phrase, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, etc., etc., becomes what I consider the, you know, there's no creeds in the Old Testament. Like we have the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. There's really no official creed in the Old Testament. But if we had to pick a creed for the Old Testament, it's really this verse. This, is, this verse is repeated in multiple ways in the Old Testament. Uh, in the prophets, in the Psalms, in here in the Torah, in the Pentateuch. But God is a gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love. And it's interesting that Moses, in prayer, appeals to that. That's what he's appealing to. Lord, if you destroy these people, what will they say about you? You're a gracious God, slow to anger, etc., etc. So that's, that's important to know that Moses is a man of prayer and a man particularly as someone who changes God's mind. He, 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 prayer is effective. James says the prayer of a righteous person, what? Availeth much. Prayer is effective. It's not just something we go through the motions and doing. It actually, and you know, to be honest with you, 
we think we're quote unquote changing God, but really we're changing ourselves is what we're doing. It, it, you know, God, we're getting in alignment with who God is, is what, what really is happening with God. Does God change? I know all you Presbyterians are saying there's no way that God changes. And in a sense, his ontology, his being, never changes. That's exactly right. But he's able to move and shape according to what we pray. And there's a, some, some type of fluidity that it doesn't change his being. It doesn't change you know, the, the destination of things. But it actually changes us, especially in that process. Um, but no, um, well, anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet there. Uh, <laughs> Moses, number one, he's, he's the man of prayer. Number two, it's important, the Psalms are divided in two major halves, as we've talked about. There's five books, right? Book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. But if we had to break the Psalms in half, it happens right here. This is the two major breaks of the Psalms. The first three books, this is book one, book two, book three, is really geared more toward an earthly king who's in charge, but at the end, if you read Psalm 89, it's a long psalm, it's about the failure of the earthly king, the Davidic king. You know, they put their hopes in the Davidic king, didn't they? And what happened? <laughs> what happened to the Davidic kingship in the Old Testament? It failed. It failed, ultimately. Quote, unquote, failed. <laughs> they were sent into exile. So Psalm 90 comes about as the first prayer, really, in response to that. So really, it's in, it's in, it's in response to a national catastrophe. The first book, first Psalms are really about how you deal with an earthly king. And then the second part of the Psalms is how do you deal with a real, true, heavenly king, who's really our king anyway. And Moses kind of gets it started here with Psalm, Psalm 90. Uh, that's enough about that. There's, there's a lot going on there, but... Let's talk about Psalm 90 in particular here. There are three major movements to the psalm. The first six verses deal with um, God's sovereignty um, throughout history. God's sovereignty throughout history. I'm trying to think of a better way to say that. Oh, here it is. It's really those first six verses are about the contrast between God being uh, infinite and us being by night. Look at those first six verses with me again. Hey, hey, come in, come in. Look at the language here. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. You're our refuge in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's God's infinite nature. He's He's gonna He's from the beginning and He will be infinite. Forever and ever. But notice how it's contrasted here in the psalm. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. And then it talks about the time of God. A thousand years in your sight are as yesterday. This is echoed in First Peter. Peter echoes that comment in, in the book of or Epistle of First Peter. You sweep people away as with a flood. They're like a dream. They're like grass. Except you see, so you see the picture here. God is um, infinite, we are finite. Everybody in this room, can we can agree on that, right? <laughs> we know, if you don't know you're finite, then we're kidding ourselves. We are finite creatures, but God is infinite. So it's in prayer, this is a recognition of Moses. And surely Moses must have known how, how infinite God was when he was on Mount Sinai and he got the Ten Commandments. And this amazing experience with God. And how he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Oh my goodness, these millions of people out of this, the world dominating power, friends. This is, he, God took his people out of the world do, dominion, really. So Moses saw this powerful God over and over again. And, but then he realizes, oh my goodness, what are we in relationship to this, this amazing God? So, we are finite. We are finite. God is infinite. And one thing I want you to take away from those first six verses is that we need to remember God is our refuge. God is our dwelling place. 
God is inviting us, or Moses through this prayer is inviting us to remember that when we see a contrast between God and ourselves, we should cling to God. We should know that our finitude is wrapped up in his infinitude. He's our dwelling place. So instead of running away from God, we're supposed to cling to God. Do you see what I mean? If we have a need in our lives, we've got to go to the one who can meet the need, the infinite one. That's what he's saying. See, that, that first four. So in our prayer life, let us, let us continue to pray. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. When we leave this earth, our finitude, we, somebody's going to come after us, our children, our grandchildren, and all these generations, depending on how long the Lord tarries, God's going to keep going. And so we recognize that he's our dwelling place. He's, our dwelling, he's going to be the dwelling place for the people that come after us. So those are the first six verses. But then... Very interestingly, in verses 7 through 11, it, there's a change in tone, big time, big time. For we are brought to an end by your anger. Oh, my goodness. By your wrath, we are dismayed. And so now the psalmist, or in this case Moses, gets very contemplative about his relationship with the Lord and God's, and God's anger and wrath. And, and, and basically, he's noticing his own sins in verse 8. You have set our iniquities before us. What does that mean, you've set our iniquities before us? Before What's you. the idea there? To remind us? Yeah. They're, they're, if we're truly, in, if we're in the presence of a holy God, guess what happens? You realize what a sinful person you are. Because God is truly holy and other, and we're not. And so we're reminded of who we truly are, you know, in our, in our sinfulness, in our iniquities, right? It's, 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 it's a sobering thought to know who God is and who in, in our relationship at first, isn't it? If we're truly honest with ourselves. For all our days pass away under your wrath, verse 9. We bring our years, we bring our years to an end like a, like a sigh. And so he goes on. And then he talks about this famous verse here. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They're soon gone, and, and we fly away. So, Michael, that was a long time to live back then, 70 or 80, wasn't it? It was, because the lifespan of an, well, let's just say during the time of David, would have been 35, 40, 40 years old. 40 yeah, at the lowest. Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is a long time. So now we can say... We can live to be 100 or 120, some of us. I don't know. I'm, we don't have too many of those folks that do that. But, um, yeah. But, a question on that. You know, they don't have predecessors, however, live to be 900, 800, 700. Right. Were they different years? Were they what? Different, were they different, different years. years. Yes, different yes. These are all pre-flood uh, years. So something happened during the flood um, that had some type of different effect on human beings. But once the flood happens, the universal flood, there's a different kind of... I mean, you start seeing the years go down after the flood big time. So if you got Methuselah in 969, well, after the... And Noah's still pretty old, but after that, they start... Then the years start so, decreasing. So it wasn't a change in measurement. It was a change in the subject. Human strength. Yeah. And the, yes. yes. But there, there was, a, was a statement made that there wasn't going to be someone living... I forget the exact yes. wording of it. Yeah. But there was a proclamation there right. that said no one would be, and then they have it. Right, exactly. Yeah. So with the flood came judgment, uh, another type of judgment, right, on humanity, mm -hmm. big time. In, in fact, in Genesis chapter 6, it says that the, the evil that the human beings were doing was, un, un, was catastrophic. You know, that's what brought about the flood, is the catastrophic evilness of humanity. But once done, that was promised never to happen again. Exactly. And it, and it never has, and it never will. Exactly. But the New Testament tends to say it will. I mean, the current controversy in uh, Israel is just an example of the beginning of that possible end. Right. We're not going to end on a good note, except for the coming of our Lord. That's true. That's true. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. yeah. and then we're going to get into that in, in the parable. I mean, you know, it says... Yeah. You know, in the second coming, there will be judgment. That, you know, we kid ourselves if we don't think there will be a judgment when Christ comes. That's why we plead the blood of Christ. That's why we're in Christ, with Christ, by Christ. We are saved. 
and uh, we, we have a certain hope and a certain future that we don't have to worry about judgment. But the rest of the world will, will face a judgment. There's no doubt about it. Um, a very certain end, as it were. Uh, the, lease, the first lease is re we're talking about is uh, Genesis 6 mm -hmm. of 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. Right. And that's during mm -hmm. the time of the Nephilim. Right. Right. So there's clearly a... The, clearly, the writer there is letting us know that humanity will not be living near as long as they used to after the flood. So, yeah. Well, what's going on in these, these verses here, 7 through 11, is really a recognition. Um, if we're finite, and if we know we're sinful, we know we need forgiveness. Or we should, come, we should know that God, through His Holy Spirit, is trying to bring us to a point of repentance. A point of knowing that we need to be forgiven. Um, and so he, he recognized that. What's happening in verse 11? Someone read verse 11, 90 verse 11. Anybody? But who regards the power of your wrath and who considers the fierceness of your anger? Yeah, so the question is operative here. Um, what's going to happen with your wrath? There's only one good solution for God's wrath. Right? And that is verse 12 through 17. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord. Have pity on your servants. So in our sin, we plead the blood of Christ as Christians. Have pity on us, Lord. Uh, we, are, we are sinful in front of you. Uh, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. It's only by the love of Jesus Christ that we're saved, right? The, the redemptive death and resurrection. That we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Uh, you can't be glad in your life unless you know you're forgiven. <laughs> you can't, unless you know your, your future is certain. That's the only way you can be glad in your life. Remember, blessing, the word mean, being blessed means being made happy by God. That's what it means to be blessed. Only God can bless us. Only God can make us happy in this life. And it's through his son Jesus that he makes us happy in this life. Make us glad, verse, verse uh, 15, as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we've seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to your children. Let the favor of the Lord... We know that only Christ gives us favor. We have no favor. What is favor? Good standing, Good standing with, with God. Only through Christ do we have favor, right? And this psalmist, even though Christ did not come, this, in this case Moses, he knows that it's only in the favor of our Lord that our, our work will matter, our service will matter. And that's why he says, establish the work or the service of our hands. Establish the work of our hands, right? And we'll get into more of that in the parable. So that's that's the psalm in a nutshell, uh, the movements here. So three movements. One is verses one to six. God is infinite. We are finite. When we realize that and we come into his presence, verses seven through 11, we realize that our sin creates wrath to God, right? Our sin creates God's anger, okay? And there's only one solution to that, and that is to plead the blood of Christ in verses 12 to 17, to pray, to petition. Verses 12 to 17 is Moses' petition to God. He's praying all these specific petitions to God here. Um, have pity on us, Lord. Have compassion on us, etc., etc. Any questions, comments? Uh, so far, I'm going to talk about how this might relate to the New Testament a little more, uh, more in particular. Any question, comment? Okay, so this this psalm is not quoted in the New Testament. It's got no quotation in the New Testament, which is interesting to me because I would have thought this one might be quoted, but it's not. Uh, but the 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 uh, themes of it are throughout the New Testament. The themes are just everywhere, and the main idea is how can a holy God dwell with a rebellious people. That's essentially the idea of Psalm 90. How can a holy God dwell with a rebellious people? And so a couple of things to note here from the New Testament. Number one, in Messiah, Jesus, we have a resolution to this question. How 
can a holy God dwell with the rebellious people? The answer is in Jesus. <laughs> That's how it happens. So if you look at John 1.14, let's turn over there. We're going to look at a couple of verses in the New Testament here. John chapter 1, verse 14 gives us some answers. If you got that, please, if you do ever find it first, why don't you read it for us? Don't be shy. The word became flesh. I was raised as a Baptist. Amen. Amen. Read the scripture. Sword drill. Read the scripture here. Sword oh, drill. Man. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The only way an un, a, a holy God could dwell with an unholy people is for God to become one of us. Mm -hmm. That's it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? Yes. So God had become one of us. Now, look at Hebrews. Flip over to the end of your new, more towards the end. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. What does the writer of Hebrews tell us about this situation? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Someone read that when you get it. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus, in his death, dealt with the problem of human sin definitively. Definitively. Once, we say in the Eucharist, once and for all. There's no question about it. In the death of Jesus Christ, sin has been taken care of. By God. By God. He became one of us, John 1, 14. And when he became one of us, he dealt with the problem of sin definitively. Now look, turn back to John chapter 10, verse 10. And let's see what else we might learn about this problem of sinful humanity with uh, a holy God. John chapter 10, verse 10. Again, someone will read that when you get it. John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal, to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So our life, what did Moses tell us about our lives? And, you know, we live how long? Possibly. 70 years. 80 years. 70, 80 years. That's a brief time of life. No matter how you slice it. Even if you live to be 120, it's going to be a brief life. What did Jesus come to do about our life? John 10, 10. I came that you might have life and have it to the fullest. So it doesn't matter how long we have on this earth. We have an abundant life, whether we're here or whether we go on to be with the Lord. God has given us a life full of, of life, <laughs> to be redundant there. We have a life full of life now. And what is more... Jesus brings significance to the lives that we live and to the work we seek to accomplish. As Jesus says in his parable about the talents, he's given us the resources to serve him. That's how come we serve him. Because when Jesus left his work, he had done the work that the Father had given him. Amen? Yes. He had done the work. He says, I came to do the Father's will and work on this earth. And when I leave, I'm going to hand the baton. The baton is our... New Zealand bishop said, uh, what was it? Batten. 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 Yeah, we had a New Zealand bishop at Sydney, the, the Batten. So we're passing the Batten off, the baton. <laughs> Jesus passes the baton off to us. And when he passes the Batten off or baton off with us, he says, you're going to do the work that I give you. You're going to do the service that I give you. And so and that, what does Moses say at the end of Psalm 90 about work? The last verse of Psalm 90 says what? Prosper the, work. Prosper the work of our hands, O oh Lord. Prosper the work of our hands. See, God gives us the favor in our work, in obedience to the Son, Jesus Christ, you see. And so this, this is how Jesus fulfills this kind of prayer here. If we look at the end of Mark chapter 16, it says the Lord worked with them. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. The Lord worked with them. In other words, he's there to give our lives meaning, 
right? So how do we deal with our finitude? Being finite, friends. Help us out here. What lessons from your own life have you learned that can help us today about how to deal with our finite lives in, in light of God's infinite nature in your Christian walk? How can, what, 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 what uh, examples do you have or, or, or encouragements do you have for us this morning? How can we live lives full of meaning and service to the Lord today here in Cashers, North Carolina, or wherever the Lord has put you, Highlands and Sapphire and throughout the southeast here. Uh, how can we live lives of meaning? Through prayer. If we don't pray and we rely on ourselves, we'll be in trouble. Prayer is the key. Prayer is the key. Jesus was a man of prayer. You know, in, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels, it says Jesus would pray all night sometimes. But then what does he do when he's done praying at night? Typically, What do the Gospels say? In the morning, he goes out to do the will of the Father. That's exactly right. There's a pattern to prayer. There's a pattern of going and being with God. Recharging, we say recharging the batteries, however you want to think about that. But we're doing it to serve the Lord. Prayer is a means to help us to serve the Lord, to commune with the Father, right? And then serve. Good. Prayer is such a key. It always will be the, the main key to the Christian life. I think gratitude is another. Uh, help us out. Well, you know, if you're struggling or you're having a hard thing, I'm focused, I'm focused on me or that situation. But if I can be grateful, look for opportunity to be grateful in the day, it changes my perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a matter of state of mind, changing our state of mind, our state of spirit, our state of, of, of perspective uh, about what's most important in life. Um, I think that's key. I think that's key. I think that's excellent. Absolutely. It's helped me a lot. Absolutely. Others? I stay in the Word. You have to read the Bible all the way through to know exactly who God is so you can depend on Him. Mm -hmm. It's full of promises. Even I know I, when I was afraid before my cancer results mm -hmm. had been in, the only thing I wanted to do, not that Crawford wasn't encouraging, but I realized a business major at Ole Miss didn't know whether I was going to live or die. <laughs> you know? Only God knew that. And, uh, you know, God, all I wanted to do was stay in the Word, and it was comforting. And he did something. He removed my fear totally, mm. which doesn't mean it's yeah. all the time. If I got another bad diagnosis or something mm -hmm. right then. Mm -hmm. But he, it's just you've got to know who he is or you won't depend on him. That's right. And all his attributes, like he is our refuge, he is our strength, right. and that he's there all the time. Yeah. So I think he really shows up in hard times. Not that I'm saying let's all have hard times for Thanksgiving, <laughs> but, you know, he's, he's so present then. It's just, it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. And you can share that with others going through whatever cancer or whatever. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's a good word. Christine, you want to say something? <laughs> Um, I think about uh, how to find that meaning in life from a pro-life point of view, not just about you know saving babies, saving all, us old people, but every day reminding uh, ourselves that we are the, we are that abundant life. We have that abundant life, mm -hmm. and as we go through our day, if we can emanate that abundant life in some way, be a life-giving uh, force, if you will, okay. uh, through the Holy Spirit, then the meaning will materialize. Right. Amen. Amen. That's good. John? I, I totally agree, and I'd like to compare life as opposed to living. Mm -hmm. God gives us life, abundant life. A living person can be a person in the hospital on life support. They're living, but do they have a life? Right. We have a life so that we can share that life, those experiences in hopes of giving other people life. That they're just not existing from day to day, yeah. but they can enjoy you know, the promises that God offers. Amen. Amen. And, and, and someone who lives life has hope, you know, yeah. and that's in the resurrection of Jesus, in the one who gave, gives us life. That's exactly right. Amen. Others? Peace. Oh. 
Don't forget peace. Don't forget peace. Shalom. Be made well. Absolutely. Only Christ can give us peace. But Don't all the peace. choices, prayer, being in the word, gratitude, all of those are our self-choices. Yeah. Right. Right. Desiring what God desires. For having us. the abundant life. We have to choose we have to choose it. Yeah. And pursue it. Amen. Amen. Thank Larry? Yeah, just uh, related to back to prayer. Um, for verse 12 here, you know, the teaching us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So prayer also being a relationship and not just a request, um, so that in that relationship, God's changing our heart. And um, and it, I think it's important, and it's, it's all through Proverbs too, but that <clears throat> wisdom in our heart, not our head, um, so that we are, we're changed from within and that affects people around us. Um, but we have to apply that, so we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like letting God do that change in your relationship with him to have that wisdom trickle down to your heart so that you're doing his will. Yeah, amen. That, that is an excellent point. Uh, the verb there in verse 12, it, it's an agricultural verb, to gain or to cultivate. Right. I like that word cultivate. Mm -hmm. Anything to, anything to, that grows has to be cultivated. Tilling the earth. Tilling the earth, your heart. exactly. You're tilling, you know, through the Holy Spirit and through cooperation with the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit leads the relationship, but we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Right, uh, the yeah. Holy Spirit's not going to overpower our will. <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit's going to come and say, "Let's let's think about this and how you have might have more life in your life through this through this relationship, through the relationship that we have." Right, and I like another thing that you said, Larry, is that it's not just about the mind. So much of evangelical Christianity is how we might think right, and that's important because that's that's thinking right thoughts. But it's equally important to have the right heart and the right will you know and desires too and that all comes together it's, it's it's all tied in there together so yeah any any final comment here about how we might uh, live our lives uh, in Christ John I know you've got something you you just I see the mind uh, turning <laughs> I've had another one of my experiences lately and this one involved a verse which I'm, is a never dear memory verse I learned a long time ago and it's it's prominent now, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. And what it says is, uh, we cast down all arguments and every presumption that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Hmm. And then the second part of the verse, which is what became very apparent to me, was we bring into captivity every thought hmm. be captive to the mind of Christ. Yes, yes. And uh, what I've discovered is, is that all the memories that I keep about the things of which I have no pride. Mm -hmm. uh, they come back and come back and come back. The guilt, the worry, uh, the shame, uh, just bad decisions, things like that. When they come back, I say that first, they disappear. Amen. And controlling your mind is the first step towards controlling your actions. Mm -hmm. um, yes. If you ever watch a high diver, if you ever watch, if you, that's interesting to you at all, doing the Olympics come along, it's magnificent. And the contortions they go through in the air are remarkable before they eventually hit the water. Mm -hmm. But one thing you'll notice if you pay attention to it is that the head always leads. Mm -hmm. You're going to do a somersault forward, your chin goes down. Yeah. If you're going backwards to do a gainer, your head goes back. Right. If you're going to do a twist, your head turns to the left or to the right, as the case might be. And such is the, the life we live. The mind begins. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure what the heart is. The heart may be the consolidation of all that we are. Right, right. And when right. God comes into our heart, you know, but we talk about our heart, and our heart emanates this, our heart emanates that, but what is our heart? Yeah. And as opposed to the soul and the spirit. But anyway, that's a, it's, it, that'll, that's a question that we answer when we get to be with him. Yeah. And uh, we'll figure out what it, all, what it all really means. But uh, in the meantime, as we live in these, these decrepit bodies, you know, our mind leads. And so it's so important to have good communications, which is, we're very loose to that. 
Yes. Um, I had the misfortune of going to business school at one time. <laughs> <laughs> I learned, uh, one thing I learned about organizational behavior, which I grabbed hold of, as I saw a lot of practice, it followed this adage, which is that most organizations operate at 40% efficiency. Right. Because of the poor communications among the people that make up the organization. So, you know, our mind controls our tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people say there's a straight line between the heart and the mouth. That's Norwood's adage. <laughs> but I think all of us have a straight line between our mind and uh, our mouth. And, you know, we all go through a filter. And that's yeah. what improves our mind is the word. If we keep the word constant in our mind, yeah. we're told to pray constantly. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Pray without ceasing. The only way to pray constantly is keep, it, keep the scripture in front of Memorizing scripture may be your best, not the best, but one way uh, to let the scripture dominate your thinking. Mm -hmm. It's a great foundation. Yes. It's a great, and we've lost that part in our culture to, mm -hmm. to memorize scripture yes. it's, it's to our detriment. Mm -hmm. Well, go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. We'll see you in worship here in just a few minutes. Thank you for uh, everything. It's wonderful.